Thank you. Well, good morning. First of all, thank you for giving me the opportunity of being here today. Before starting the presentation, the, the disclaimers, this is only my views and do not represent the, the position of the IMCMA or one of its committees or working parties. Well, this is the title of my talk, Regulatory Challenge in the Era of Personalized Medicine, the EMA Perspective on Drug Approval Process in the Era of Precision Medicines. Drug Approval Process and Precision Medicine. Well, what is precision medicines? This is the definition that FDA has, and I like it. Innovative approach to tailoring disease prevention and treatment that takes into account difference in people's genes, environments, and lifestyle. And maybe the most important is the, the following statement. The goal of precision medicine is to target the right treatments to the right patient at the right time. I find this is perfect definition of precision medicine. And this sounds for me of, of something related to biomarker targeted therapy. And what is the, the, the regulatory guidelines that we have here in Europe about this biomarker of this type of targeted therapies in order to carry out uh, clinical development based on biomarkers in, in oncology? Well, we have the, the current guideline on the evaluation of anti-cancer medicinal products in man, and in this specific guideline we have a specific section talking about biomarkers, and it is the section five. And in this slide we can see that there is different statements about how to carry out this clinical development in, 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 in targeted therapy based on, on, on the presence of the biomarker. In order to put, in order to optimize benefit risk, it is essential to identify the proper target population for therapy. A second one, a biomarker should be capable of measuring and evaluating a normal biological process, a pathological process, or the pharmacological response to a therapeutic intervention depending on its purpose. If convincing evidence of biomarker selectivity is established early in the non-clinical and clinical development, phase confirmatory evidence in the negative population may not be required. And this is important because in other ways we, we are saying that if you have results in the complementary group, maybe you don't need to carry out this evidence in the biomarker negative population. And the last one, um, I think this is maybe is, is, is the most important. For the using confirmatory studies, and for example, as measure of efficacy, biomarkers must be carefully and rigorously validated, ideally, following systematic evaluation in well-designed prospective clinical trials. And this is the most important statement of this section of the, of the guideline. And I think that we could summarize all of this evidence, all of this statements in order to carry out this clinical development of this target therapy based on biomarket in uh, some kind of checklist like this. This is a checklist proposed by Jan Schellens in the last latest workshop of the Oncology Working Party and the, in, in, in the EMA that we had in December about histolidiagnostic indication. And I like this, this, this kind of, of checklist. We need to know the mechanism of action. We need to know if the mechanism of action is tumor independent, tumor tissue independent or not. The, the <coughs> proof of counsel of concept at the preclinical level. Of course, we need to know the, the safety in the non-clinical models and we have to validate it, the biomarker and the proof of concept in the clinical part and of course the safety profile of this drug. But maybe the most important is to carry out the pivot or randomized studies. Ideally, the blind or randomized and so on. And what about the activity in other tumor types? Is in histology independent or not? And of course, we need an unmet medical need. And thinking about this, I think that is 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 interesting the, the following examples, and, and I'm going to tell you a story, a story of three different biomarkers and targeted therapies. The first one is the PD1 anti PD1 immunotherapies. As you know, we have several anti PD1 anti PD1 already authorized in Europe right now, 
Di polumat, pen polizumab, patriozulizumab, and avelumab. Di polumab is authorized in melanoma, in no small cell lung cancer, in second line, in renal cell carcinoma, second line, classical hot kill lymphoma, head and neck, second line, and bladder cancer, in second line. And pen polizumab is more or less the same. Melanoma, no small cell lung cancer in first, in first line, but all in those patients with a, a clear positivity for pd one expression. In second line of no small cell lung cancer, like nivolumab, in the Hodgkin lymphoma, and in, in, in bladder cancer, both in first and in second line. Atezo in, in bladder cancer and no small cell lung cancer, and abelumab, maybe this is the most special case in, in Merkel cell calcium. Well, we have similar indication, different histologies. So, anything in common? Of course, the mechanism of action. Nivolumab and penvolizumab, anti-PD1. Atezolizumab and avolumab, anti-PD1. But in the end, it's the same. The objective is just to remove the conhibitory signals that block the anti-tumor T cell response. So, if we have four different products, but with the same mechanism of action or something similar, authorizing different histologies, maybe we should look for a common pattern, a biomarker, and which biomarker? PDL1. I think this PDL1 is expressing antigen representing cells, or maybe expressed by tumor or other cells in the tumor microenvironment. This ligand is directly involved in the mechanism of action of all of these checkpoint inhibitors. And PD1 expression could be useful as biomarker. But my friend, we have a problem. We have different antibodies, we have different cutoffs, and we have different targets, immune cells, tumor cells. But what are the data telling us? Well, this is the Kaplan Mayer for survival in no small cell lung cancer for nivolumab. In the upper side of the, of the slide, we can see that Patients treated with nivolumab in this second line of no small cell lung cancer versus docetaxel obtain a clear benefit in terms of overall survival. And this benefit is highly dependent on the pd one expression with different cutoff, 1, 5, or 10 percent. But in the other part of the slide, at the bottom, we observe that there is no benefit for this patient treated with nivolumab versus docetaxel. And these patients are PDL1 negative or low expression of PDL1, 1, 5, and 10 percent. Another example the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab in melanoma. We have different results according to PDL1 expression. No benefit in PDL1 positive persons for the combination of nivo along with EP versus nivo monotherapy. And maybe a, a survival benefit restricted to PDL1 negative patients for this combination. Another one, Checkmate 275, multicenter single arm phase 2 trial in bladder cancer, bladder cancer. We observe that there is a benefit in terms of survival for these patients treated with nivolumab. And if we split this survival benefit according to the PDL1 expression, we observe a clear difference between those patients considered PDL1 positive or PDL1 negative with this cutoff of 1%. So, coming back to this checklist of this proposal of, of, of target therapy based on biomarker, I think that we could tick several boxes of, in this checklist. We know the established, we know the mechanism of action. We know that the mechanism of action can be tumor tissue independent. We have the proof of concept at preclinical level. We know the preclinical safety. Do we have a validated bio biomarker? Maybe. We have clinical data, and we know the clinical profile of these drugs. And of course, we have several pivotal randomized clinical studies. And we know the activity in other tumor types. We have several tumor types in this clinical development. And of course, there is a medical need in these patients. So 
PDL1. Apparently, the PDL1 expression could be a good biomarker or not. This is the couple measure of overall survival for nivolumab, nivolumab versus everolimus in renal cancer. Second line. There is a benefit for these patients treated with nivolumab, but regardless of the PDL1 expression. There is no a clinical meaningful difference between those patients considered PDL1 positive or those patients considered PDL1 negative with this cutoff of 1%. And in this slide, we can observe different statements that are collected in the post information on all of these checkpoint inhibitors. The clinical utility of PDL1 as predictive biomarker in Merkel has not been established in the Avelumab protein formation. The efficacy and safety of pembrolizumab in patients with tumor that do not express PDL1 have not been established, no small cell lung cancer. Survival benefit was observed regardless of whether patients had tumor that were designed PDL1 negative or PDL1 positive. This is in the nivolumab melanoma indication. And the last one, the magnitude of survival benefit was consistent for 1, 5, and 10 percent tumor PDL1 special levels in the head and neck nivolumab. So, in conclusion, we think that the use of PDL1 as a biomarker could help to maximize the benefit. However, it doesn't seem very reliable at the time of the decision making process. Low expressors, even with a small or no difference in efficacy versus the standard of care, could benefit from a better safety profile compared to chemotherapy. It is difficult to establish a cutoff among all the checkpoint inhibitors because we know that each checkpoint inhibitor has a different cutoff. And the role of biomarkers PDL1 or PDL2 expression as potential predictive of pronostic biomarkers remains undetermined. So, what have we learned from the anti PDL1 story? That PDL1 cannot be used as biomarker. And this is the probably the only certain we have. Second example, second story. The PAR inhibitors, Olaparib and Niraparib. I'm going to be focused only in Niraparib case. The Hula Niraparib received in September 2017 a positive opinion from the CHMP for the treatment of maintenance treatment of ovarian cancer. And this was based on this mechanism of action, this biological possibility of this, of this drug, based on that in normal cells, homologous recombinant repair which requires functional BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes is affected at repairing DNA. So based on this concept of synthetic lethality, everyone knows that tumor with a deficiency in the homologous recombinant DNA repair pathway are extremely sensitive to PAR inhibitors, right? So this is the pivotal clinical trial for neoparib in the 99 ovarian cancer. Patients were treated with neoparib versus placebo in this maintenance setting. And patients were stratified according to the BRCA status, general line BRCA status. And in this population, in, 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 the, in the BRCA mutation positive, there is a clear benefit for those patients treated with neoparib. We have a longer PFS. And even in the other biomarker, in the HRD positive subgroup, we have the same results. Okay, it's perfect. Longer PFS for those patients considered biomarker positive. And what about in the BRCA mutated negative patients? This is a group of BRCA mutated <coughs> negative patients, the complementary subgroup to this one, and we observe the same benefit. Maybe it's because this is not the right biomarker and maybe we need another biomarker, more reliable, and maybe this biomarker is the HDR, maybe. But when we analyze the HDR negative subgroup, we observe that there is also a benefit for patients. And even in the BRCA wild type somatic mutation, without this mutation, we observe benefit. So what's going on? What's the value of this biomarker? 
And this is the consequence of the world of indication of for the hula. It's indicating more therapy from the maintenance treatment of platinum sensitive ovarian cancer, but without any mention to the BRCA mutation. But surprise, surprise, Olaparib, Limpartha, has another indication. It's indicated all in BRCA mutated patients. Same mechanism of action, same patients treated with these two targeted therapies. The last case, MSHI, colorectal cancer, maybe the most problematic. <laughs> Last year, 2017, the FDA granted accelerated approval to nivolumab for the treatment of patients with mismatch repair deficiency and MSHI metastatic colorectal cancer in last line of colorectal cancer after a previous treatment with at least fluoropyrimidine oxalic platinum and irinotecan. And this was based on this study, the, the Checkmate 142. The Checkmate 142 is a phase two clinical trial of nivolumab monotherapy in recurrent or metastatic MSHI, colorectal cancer, a multi-country, multi-center study with a broad patient population, BRAF mutant, Car Carras mutant, Lynch syndrome. And we have that 72% of the patients, including this trial, receive prior treatment with fluoropyrimidine, oxaliplatin, and irinotecan. In other words, in last line. Almost 30% of response in this last line of colorectal cancer, in this population MSHI positive, <coughs> with a hopefully longer enough duration of the response. But here, the CHMP decision was negative and the company withdraw the application for this specific indication of nivolumab. And this was based, basically, that the results of the main study were insufficient to determine the benefit of, of D1 in these patients. And because of the study, did not compare D1 with other treatments. So, in other words, this was a single trial, and we don't really know what the pronostic value of the biomarker is in this population. So what's the train home message? Well, I think that a good knowledge of the biomarker is important, but not critical. Randomized clinical trials are always the gold standard. I think this is the most important message. Always randomized clinical trial is the gold standard and is the best way to demonstrate the benefit. The predictive pronostic value of the biomarker could be of utmost importance in absence of this randomized clinical trial, because otherwise it's impossible to know what the value of this treatment could be, or it's impossible to contextualize the results. Is there a positive benefit in the complementary subgroup? Because in the Cejula example, we know that is, there is a benefit for all comers. And Maybe the most important is that targeted therapies have been a milestone in oncology, of course, without a doubt. That's all. Thank you.